You're listening to 17 Karat K-Pop. For more about this show, as well as my other podcast, How to Stand, visit 17karatkpop.weebly.com. There you'll find episode guides, as well as additional reading, more exclusive content, tons of great stuff. And never miss an update, an album review, interview, etc. by subscribing to the free newsletter, howtostand.substack.com. You could also become a paying subscriber on Substack, and that means you're supporting an independent creator and become part of a community, howtostand.substack.com. Enjoy the show! Hello everybody! Welcome back to 17 Karat K-Pop in a very special series of episodes. All week long, I will be diving into a ton of movie references in K-pop songs and music videos. Movies that have inspired K-pop stars or are rumored to have inspired them. All things the K-pop cinema connection. Without further ado, let's dive right into it. We have to start off this whole series of episodes by talking about one of the first movies, period. And basically the first science fiction movie. It's called A Trip to the Moon a French film made in 1902 by Georges Miles. You may have heard Miles and seen him referenced in The Invention of Hugo Cabret, the movie and the book, with that famous image of the moon with a face and the bullet pierces the eye of the face, literally shooting the moon. That's from this short film. And last I checked, it actually is on YouTube. So if you want to view the absurdities that were 1900s filmmaking, early 1900s, go ahead. It's actually quite, it's really funny and bonkers because they didn't have really special effects. So all of the alien insects in the movie are just humans in costumes. It's also very clear. It's not really a smooth cutaway showing the bullet hit the eye of the moon. It just clearly shows the scene where the moon is just fine. And then all of a sudden there's a scene where now the bullet's in the eye. There's no transition. They don't show the bullet entering his eye. Then there's the fact that when you pick up these alien insects in the movie, they basically die by you throwing them, and they poof away in a puff of smoke. So again and again, they defeat these alien creatures by just throwing them. And then when they hit the ground, poof, again and again. Smoke was their main usable special effect. I'm getting ahead of myself, though, because after watching this, I just had so many thoughts that I have to get out there. But first, there is a connection here between Miele's work in Nap of a Star, a TXT music video. Not so much in the plot as the aesthetics, which actually is tangentially related to the plot. You see, Miles was really famous for being theatrical, over the top, like he was putting on a play. That look of his movies was intentional. He wanted things to look like they were absurd, and you couldn't fully suspend disbelief. They have this lingering sense of, this is weird, this isn't real life. And you could say TXT's way of approaching storytelling in music videos has some similarities with that. Leaning on fantasy, funhouse style, changes in size, like in Blue Hour when they shrink, or they meet giant squirrels, but the proportionality is not to be expected. There are 2D animations in TXT's world. In this video, there's kind of a stop-motion animation feel to it, especially with the, the mechanical wings, the intentional costume-ish look of their outfits. You could argue that's all part of the story because TXT's whole story is about, I'm not going to sing the lyric, but imagination. And it's about trying to come to terms with who you are and maybe using fantasy elements to determine who you really are outside of the fantasy. When you come back to reality, what elements of that whimsical world of fantasy do you want to bring with you into the real world? Hopefully that makes sense is they use these theatrical elements to make a point. But you can clearly tell in the transition screens between chapters of the Nap of a Star video how they are basically an homage to Miele's work. There's also the very theatrical, staged look to Nap of a Star when the TXT members wear those big, colorful boxes on their heads. The costume aspect of it all is obvious. TXT also do have that nod to an interest in outer space. They find each other to reach the telescope. And they sing about memories of childhood dancing in the sky. Moments that felt like magic in brilliant night sky, they're on my mind. Looking to the stars and daydreaming, in essence. Okay, let's move on to getting into the real interesting, bizarre plot. This short film follows this astronomy club led by Professor Barbufui, who is like, I've got a field trip for us club members. What do you say we go to the moon? 
And they're all like, yes, that's a great idea. So they all actually build a bullet-shaped spacecraft and building a cannon to put the bullet in and then have these sailor-dressed girls shoot them into space. This team of women make the men's launch into space a success, just saying, but that's only part one of the story. Then the crew gets there and they're exploring and basically trying to colonize this place because all these insect-looking alien creatures called the Selenites start bugging them. And every time they do pick one up to throw it and kill it, another one pops up. It's a -a whack-a-mole. And pretty soon they feel outnumbered by this army of insect aliens chasing them, who eventually get the upper hand and hold this astronomy club hostage and send them up to their king so he can punish them. But once they get there, one of the members just gets up, picks up the king, and throws him on the ground. And he's squashed like a bug and dies. They travel back to Earth, land in the ocean. This dense bullet somehow floats back up after they hit the bottom of the ocean. Then a ship arrives to finish their rescue. They go home and they're celebrated and laughing off their adventure of colonization, basically. Yeah, there's a lot to read into there, and it has been. I'll link to some film scholars' critiques and commentary for all of these movies on my site, as always. Quick fun fact before we move on. Miles actually acted in over 300 of his 520 movies. And actually, all the other actors, we don't know who they were. They could be your great-great-great-grandparents, and we wouldn't know because this movie was so early. Credits were not a thing opening or ending credits. The movie just started and ended. All the actors were anonymous. All right, speaking of TXT movie references, there's this scene in Love Song, the music video where Yun Jun, he's dancing for his bandmates, basically. They're his audience as he does this solo shimmy, and it turns out it seems like in that moment that was part of his daydream. He imagined his bandmates had watched him dance with rapt attention. That solo dance is a nod to the one that the main character in this movie does in front of a mirror. This character, Yudi, who sees himself as a legless bird. So a bird that can still fly with wings, but doesn't have the tools to land. Which is a really lonely way to live up there, and a super deep metaphor that TXT and their story definitely relate to. So the the homage makes sense. This movie is called Days of Being Wild. It's a drama from Hong Kong set in the 60s, although it came out in the 90s. And it's full of an all-star cast of some of the most famous actors out of Hong Kong. It's actually part of a trilogy, too. And it was nodded to in a scene in Show Your Love, B2B for You's video. This main character, Yudi, wants to have this fling with Lee Chan, who wants to get more serious with him, but he's such a player. He moves on to this girl, Mimi, who his friend, Zeb, is also crushing on. SMH, don't do that. His relationship with his mom is really bad. After he finds out he's adopted, he feels quite betrayed. He's also always worried about his mom and thinks the guys in her life are taking advantage of her. Yes, this player dating his friend's crush is worried about his mom being treated badly by guys. She won't even reveal the country his mom is in, his birth mom. Eventually, though, she does reveal she's in the Philippines and he sets out to meet her. This one character, a policeman, is on patrol near his house. Long story short, he befriends Bonds over talks with Lichan. Whether they actually have a romantic relationship at some point, not really shown on screen, you can decide for yourself. But anyway, he ends up becoming a sailor, as he always dreamed of. After his mom dies, he doesn't need to stay in town and take care of her. This is kind of divine fate, because later on he saves the day when he finds Yudi in the Philippines, drunk and passed out. And he comes to the rescue. He also does this later, too, when Yudi really lashes out and loses it. Stabs someone, makes a scene at this train station. Yudi actually ends up getting shot. I told you a long story short. The final scenes are quite symbolic of the closing up of a ticket booth, despite the fact the phone in that booth is still ringing. Lichan is not picking up the phone. Meanwhile, Mimi, the girl his friend was crushing on that he was dating, finally shows up late after all this happens. So I guess you could read into meaning in Lichan preemptively saying show's over and not answering the phone in a ticket booth, like we lost, the lies and betrayals led to this disastrous end. This is just one interpretation of what it all means. Next movie we have to talk about. 
eternal sunshine of the spotless mind, sometimes just called eternal sunshine. I am, wrote about in a B-side, happy to die. And Taeyeon's What Do I Call You music video is just 100% no question a tribute to Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind. This movie is from 2004. It's a science fiction romance that is named after this line in a poem from 1717. Perfect for discussion on 17 karat K-pop. Quote, the world forgetting by the world forgot eternal sunshine of the spotless mind, each prayer accepted and each wish resigned. That's just one of many parts of that poem, but it gets at the gist of it, which is how nice ignorance is, how nice when you make your memory a clean slate, when you don't have to remember a relationship that, sure, may have brought you a bunch of good times, but also a lot of pain and heartbreak. So isn't it better to just get rid of it? Ignorance is bliss. Memory erasure is bliss. That is the type of psychoanalytical approach people might take to discussing this movie's premise. The movie's about this company called Lacuna. Also the name of a K-pop band, by the way, with a dope new album, just a PSA, go check it out. Lacuna specializes in you sign up for their services and they erase your memories for you. The procedure Taeyeon goes on in the What Do I Call You music video, where she gets the letter in the mail saying, hey, client, please come with a box full of every item associated with your memories of the person you now feel scorned by. Whoever you're using this procedure to erase from your memory, any physical object that reminds you of them, put it in a box and bring it to your appointment. Which she does, and in addition to that, she spends a very long time in this interview and systematically, one by one, the assistant, I guess, on the computer deletes the memory she is telling to the therapist, basically. So this team basically slowly but surely erases the memories of this guy. Then Taeyeon can go home, and she has a party, feels like she feels like a weight is lifted off her shoulders. She acts a lot more carefree. So she has a happy ending. Much more complicated version of events in the movie. There's a lot of regret surrounding what happens if you get rid of someone's good and bad memories. It's about this couple, Clementine and Joel. And Joel is distraught when he finds out Clementine ordered Lacuna's service to get rid of him. So he, of course, wants the same thing done. He feels very scorned by her and says, I'm getting the procedure too. But as you go through this procedure, you have to recall each memory. So he's recalling happy time after happy time after happy time with Clementine. He recounts the bad times, but he can't not recount the goods or the procedure wouldn't work. Patrick, being a little shirt, if you will, is a guy who works at Lacuna, and he's secretly trying to take intel from both Joel's and Clementine's procedures to mess with them and learn how to woo Clementine, win her over. During this process of basically life flashing before your eyes, only not flashing, life slowly crawling before your eyes, Joel is like, stop it, stop it. I changed my mind. I don't want this done. I don't want her forgotten. Too late, though. But then, this woman named Mary finds out she underwent a procedure there without asking. Without her consent, Lacuna took memories of an affair that weren't theirs to take. So as retaliation, she steals all the memories, the records, Lacuna has in their storage and mails them back out to the patients to tell them, hey, you don't remember this, but this is what happened to you, and here's your memory back. Joel wakes up after the procedure, and for no reason, well, you know the reason, but it's this fate, he feels this urge to go somewhere. And he goes to that specific place, and is back on the train, and him and Clementine lock eyes, it's love at first sight, but they both don't know, they've already done this before. Patrick does not get Clementine, of course, because Joel is back in her life, and Patrick sees them out on a date. After this love at first sight meet cute, they get their tapes back in the mail and find out their contents and they have to decide, hey, this is like a fortune teller's message. She's telling us it's not going to work out in the end. Bumps in the road are coming. Do we want to keep going down this path? They can decide right now, hey, preemptively let's stop this future, break it off, and avoid heartbreak later. Or enjoy the ride despite what obstacles it brings. And they choose to enjoy the ride. So it's kind of Groundhog Day-esque, although we don't see if it worked out a second time. The audience gets to decide. 
The lyrics for Happy to Die by A.M. seem to allude to the interpretation of we're choosing to go back into this Groundhog Day style again and again, we're gonna choose love now every time. The ups are worth the downs. And he sings about that saying, you brought me back to the real love. I wanna get lost here forever. We're childish like we were when we used to play back then. I don't know what this feeling is. Even if I try to pretend I don't know, everything seems to be obvious. I guess it's not a lie that I really like you. I don't want to reject you. Even if I close my eyes while I'm by your side, I'm just happy. There are a lot of ways aesthetic and editorial choices for this movie kind of mirror the, not of Taeyeon's music video, but just in general, mirror the way you can use the atmosphere, camera angles, color palettes, etc. to amplify the mood and help tell a story. And they were able to do that. There were 360 degree shots, They used handheld cameras. There was intentionally sometimes wobbly camera movement in weird angles. They also used musical motifs. Sometimes the music was kind of used for the sake of irony. The director would give Jim Carrey, who played Joel, the wrong direction on purpose. He would get wrong stage directions and otherwise be messed with so that he looked as confused, as discombobulated as his character was supposed to. He was also actually the only character on set who was banned from improving. He was not allowed to go off script because he's Jim Carrey. And he had to, he couldn't do his classic Jim Carrey thing. He had to tone it down for this role. Actually, Joel was supposed to be Nicolas Cage and Seth Rogen was going to play Patrick. The whole idea for this movie came about when the director thought of doing this psych experiment. He never actually did it, but he debated actually sending cards to people that just said blank has erased you from their memory, just to see how they would react. It would be an interesting psych experiment, but probably traumatizing and leading to lawsuits. But it is interesting to think about what would you do if someone you're mad at, you're in a fight with, but have a lot of history with good and bad, if you found out they deleted the good and bad times you've had together from their mind, they want nothing to do with them. It's really something to think about. Last movie we gotta talk about today, The Great Gatsby. I know it's a book and that's what's more famous, but I only talk about Leo DiCaprio in like 20 of these movie titles in the series it feels like, so I gotta give him more support. The Great Gatsby does seem to be one of the many cinematic influences on the aesthetics and storytelling of N hyphen. And I broke down more connections to their music video world in the N-Hyphen specific episodes, so I won't recap all of that, but I will just recap a few things of note from the story because it truly is just so weird to me. The whole story is just darkly funny. So it's set in the 1920s, and there are two types of people. You got the West Egg people living in the West Egg neighborhood. These are the ones who are like flashy, showing off their wealth, feel self-made. Then you got the East Egg people. They're also wealthy, but they were born into money, otherwise feel like they deserve to show off their wealth just by nature of who they are and what family they're a part of. So basically you have the I'm proud of how I worked my way up people, and then you have the do you know who I am people. And they both are in conflict with each other at times and against the Valley of Ashes, which is where the poor people live. Jay Gatsby lives in the West Egg and acts like it, He hosts a party every single week because this fool who can't move on really is secretly hoping one time, just one time he throws this party, his crush Daisy will actually show up. The other main character, Nick, Daisy's his cousin. So Jay kind of invites him over and tries to get his help facilitating some sort of meet cute. Nick agrees and is like, sure, I'll invite her over for tea and you'll just so happen to be there when she shows up to my house. They do lock eyes and kind of rekindle a romance, which Daisy's husband, yes, she's married, Tom, finds out about and is so mad, despite the fact Tom is also having an affair with this woman Myrtle. Yeah, this is drama. This is a reality show here. It quickly spirals from this petty dating and affair driven drama to kind of a murder mystery because Myrtle ends up being killed by a car. Gatsby's car, but Daisy was the one driving it. Gatsby says, it's my car. It'll be easy for me to take the fall for you. Let me do that. Nick is on board with this plan. He's like, sure, I'll throw Gatsby under the bus to save my cousin. So he tells George, Myrtle's husband. Yeah, Myrtle was married and having an affair too. 
So Nick tells George Gatsby did it. So George finds Gatsby, shoots, and kills him. It's after his death that Nick learns not just throwing the parties, but everything about Gatsby's rich party persona. Party hosting A-list persona was fake. He never earned money legally and fairly. He was a bootlegger. He was the son of poor farmers. It was all just to impress Daisy. This air, this keeping up appearances, the whole time was just to impress Daisy. Mission accomplished, but at what cost? And it's really a symbolic moment when Nick goes to Gatsby's funeral and no other main character shows up. Anyone who is more than a casual party-going acquaintance of Gatsby's, anyone who, if Gatsby knew they went to his funeral, it would have meant a lot to him. None of them show up. Like, no one really cared for him, but just his stuff. That wasn't even his stuff. So Nick has, at the end, a negative view of West and East Egg people, thinks they're both just out of touch, not really valuing what's important in life. Nick goes back to live in Minnesota. Connections I see to and hyphens work include that the regal wardrobe, palace settings, concept of royalty, lyrics about indulgences, the palace of pain and pleasure, excesses, the monologues about why do we desire what we cannot acquire, even there are b-sides like not for sale about why are you chasing these objects, what makes a transaction mutually beneficial, be it a relationship or an actual physical transaction, the fancy fountain, this symbolic green light, references to roses, flowers, there's some symbolic overlap as well as broader theme overlap. Because one of the ultimate themes of The Great Gatsby is time. Gatsby ultimately fails because he was hung up on his past and trying to manufacture this fake future. So he spent no time in the present and no time really learning from his past to make a real sustainable future better for himself. Which reminds me of the n hyphen monologue lines like, Time harmonizes, laughs, and screams. And we gladly swallow time like it's our last breath. Lastly, there are references to waves and the water, and in N. Hyphen's monologues, they address the sea, the midday sea, and the riptide, which reminded me of a part of Nick's narration, where he says, quote, So we beat on, boats against the current, borne back ceaselessly into the past. Thanks so much for tuning in, and I will see you all next time for more movie talk. Bye, everyone.